This is the best of Outkick, the coverage with Clay Travis on Fox Sports Radio. You know who else is in the zone? Manu Ginobili, evidently. The guy has been a member of the San Antonio Spurs since all the way back in July, I believe, of 1999. That was the time in which he was drafted by the San Antonio Spurs, and he made one of the best plays probably of the year in the NBA on defense, particularly when you consider how James Harden flops his body around everywhere and the frequency with which Harden draws contact. As Harden rose up to attempt the three-point shot there to win the game, Manu Ginobili somehow found himself behind James Harden. And you know how hard, even if you just played pickup basketball, you know how hard it is to block a shot from behind as opposed to in front in real time. And spectacularly, Ginobili managed to block perfectly that shot, and it was fabulous, just all ball. And as a result, probably the Spurs are going to overcome the Tony Parker injury. They're probably going to overcome the Kawhi Leonard uh, sprained ankle that kept him out much of the fourth quarter and for the final possession and all of overtime. And they're going to overcome remarkably one of the worst possessions that you will ever see from a Greg Popovich coach team with a chance to win the game at the end of the uh, regulation. Just finally, a really good basketball game in the NBA playoffs. Now, I don't think it matters in the grand scheme of things, and I don't think there's any uh, any aspects uh, at all at play here. But, man, what a spectacular performance all around. I'll bring in... Danny G and Justin, how surprised were you that Manu Ginobili could make that play at the age of 39, nearly, whatever it is, 18 years after he was initially drafted, and that James Harden was so shocked, I think, that the shot was blocked (laughs) that he didn't even think to try to flop and draw the call. Now, I mean, he still at the end was like, oh, but I mean, compared to how James Harden usually flops, I think it was such a clean block that he was stunned. Yeah, good for him. A dude around our age, Clay, who has a huge bald spot on his head. And to quote my girlfriend who was watching the game with me, he's still playing? Yes. And I'm like, There's a lot yeah. of people, yes. And at a high level at that. And you see the big smile on Kawhi Leonard's face. And he was limping to the locker room. Says he's going to play in the next game. But, I mean, for them to do that without Leonard on the floor, pretty amazing. Yeah, I don't know how seriously injured Kawhi Leonard is. A part of me thinks if he's got any kind of serious ankle injury at all, you sit him out for game six, give your best shot on the road at Houston, and then hope he's back close to 100% for game seven, as opposed to try to bring him back early, assuming that it's a it's a bad injury. And And by the way, if it's not a bad injury, can you imagine? Can you imagine what the reaction would have been everywhere if that were LeBron James sitting out for the final possession, and also all of overtime. Now, I'm not, I don't know how badly injured Kawhi Leonard is, but he was okay enough to play for large portions of the fourth quarter, and if he's okay to come back by game six, he's not really that badly hurt in the grand scheme of things. Uh, to me, again, if he's if he's got serious ankle issues, I would hold him out of game six, go ahead and give my best shot, and hope I could win game six on the road in Houston but really bring him back and hope that he's 100% healthy for Game 7. As I said yesterday, I don't really think this matters. Which of these two teams do you think would be easier to play if you're the Warriors? I kind of think it's the Spurs right now because the Spurs seem unhealthy. There seem like there are issues out there for them. Uh, Obviously, we don't know the full extent of Tony Parker's injuries. Kawhi Leonard battling an injury, and they just don't seem as fast or able to score points in bunches. Whereas the Rockets, if they get hot, I don't know how many three-pointers they attempted. It seemed like almost 50 in that game. If the Rockets get hot, they can score large point, large number of points in rapid fashion. But I don't necessarily think it matters. I think either of these teams are going to get beat in five games by the Warriors. As rested as the Warriors are, the fact that they'll win, I think, game one and game two. I think they'll lose one on the road, then I think they'll come back and close it out. Uh, I think that's exactly how this series is going to go, whether they're playing the Rockets or the Spurs. But we've been so desperate for a good game that I don't want to just throw cold water 
all over the game that we just witnessed. A uh, really big win for the Spurs, Greg Popovich, and in particular, Manu Ginobili, who was sitting so far down on the end of the bench that you had no idea whether or not he was ever going to make a play again that thrust him into the limelight. The uh, oldest, baldest dude in the NBA making maybe the best defensive play of the entire NBA playoffs. And you know somewhere Tim Duncan was thinking, man, I should have never retired. You know somewhere Kobe Bryant was thinking, man, I should have never retired. This is a guy, Manu Ginobili, who was drafted all the way back in 1999. What do you guys think, uh, Danny G and Justin, in terms of which team is better for the Warriors to play? Does it matter? Better for the opponent or better for us to watch on TV? Well, I mean, just in terms of actually being a decent series. Is there a team that can win two games against the Warriors? I think if you've got a healthy Kawhi, then I would go with the Spurs. See, I, I think it's I, I think the Rockets are better. I think they match up better, but I don't think it matters in the grand scheme of things because I think both teams are going to lose four out of five games. So I think it's going to be a five-game series, and the Warriors might sweep them given all the rest and everything else that they're facing and, and how beaten up the Spurs are. Uh, that is a uh, that is a brutal situation potentially to uh, to have to make uh, a play on. Jason Martin at J Mart Outkick. Which one do you think is more of a challenge for the Warriors? Spurs play better defense, but the Rockets are the only team that I've seen in the entire postseason that can actually score with the Golden State Warriors, especially when they're on from distance. Now losing Nene really does harm their ability to do damage down inside the paint, even with Capella playing pretty well. The thing that was stunning about last night was the age seemed to be on the other side of the court. The Rockets were beat, especially by the time they got to overtime. Harden looked gassed. Awful possession. minutes they, again. Every, every overtime possession was awful, it felt yes, like it to was. me. I mean, yeah, there, there were points that were scored at times, but the Rockets literally dribbled around the top of the key for oftentimes 20 seconds. I mean, there was one possession in overtime that I think was the most indefensible of all, which was it seemed like James Harden was expecting a screen. And then no screen ever came, and it's like you could see the frustration in his face, and then he just jacked up a you know 34-footer or whatever it was, and they never did anything at all in terms of offensive sets. I don't know if they were tired. I don't know if Mike D'Antoni needs to take charge there and maybe set up more defined plays. You know, I think the NBA is always interesting because I think it's almost like you have a, uh, a design for what you're trying to do, but oftentimes they don't implement specific plays. Does that make sense? Like, we're going to run a pick and roll at the top of the key. Like, there aren't a lot. It's not like the uh, college basketball, which I think is overcoached very many times, where a coach will diagram a play. In the NBA, I don't think they spend as much time doing that. You know, they do it sometimes coming out of timeouts, but I thought the Rockets needed more aggressive coaching in overtime than they got. And D'Antoni was saying, no, no, you guys just go ahead and do what we've done before, run our typical sets. And instead, the Rockets fell apart. I don't know if they were tired. I don't know if the Spurs took their defense to a different level. Uh, I, I haven't been able to break down the film. All I know is that they tried to get bailed out. The Rockets did. That was their game to win, in, in all honesty. The Rockets, I think, should have won that game. The Spurs couldn't hit anything for about five minutes down the stretch in the fourth quarter. And the Rockets couldn't either. Couldn't put that white game away. Couldn't create any space. And then in overtime, I still felt like it was their game to win. And they couldn't do anything. And uh, if you're a Rockets fan, given the fact that 88% of the time, whoever wins game five wins this series, got to be a little bit sick. Again, I don't think it matters in the grand scheme of things because I don't think either one of these teams is beating the Warriors, but it is a step to advance to the Western Conference Finals, even if you end up losing there. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, this was sort of a, a strange game in a lot of respects. I do think they were tired, meaning Houston in overtime. But you look at some of the performances last night, Ginobili, of course, turns the clock back. That's what a great player does when he knows that this is going to be it. Maybe he can give you a couple of good games. So he goes out there and he gives you 12. He gives you five assists. He gives you seven boards. But LaMarcus Aldridge had given San Antonio precisely nothing in the postseason. And he goes out and gives you 18 and 14 last night. Patty Mills with 20. They had six guys in double figures. And then on the other side, you only get 17 between Eric Gordon and Lou Williams. So it just it just played out well for the Spurs. And even though I think the Rockets are the better series, I don't think Houston can win two in a row against San Antonio right now. They had to win that game last night because, as you said, Clay, that was their game, and they let it slip through their fingers. I don't think you can do that against Greg Popovich and hope to win both game six and game seven against San Antonio, even – when they're a little bit depleted. Presumably, 
Kawhi Leonard is right and he's actually going to play in game six. Now, if he doesn't, that might change it. Maybe we get a game seven out of it. But I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news or to agree with everybody else, but we're still just watching a series. These guys are now killing each other to see who's going to get beheaded in the Western Conference Finals. Who... How much criticism would LeBron James get if he had set out like Kawhi Leonard did? Let's go around the horn. Start with you, Jason Martin. How much criticism is LeBron James getting today? Because, I, I look, I, I don't ever like to say somebody's not hurt that bad. Do you compare what – I mean, it looked like to me as he went off the court, Kawhi Leonard was doing that like like I'm going to exaggerate my limp move. I mean, he mm-hmm. played – I'm not saying that he was 100%. I'm not saying that he was extraordinary when he was on the court. But it wasn't like he was so utterly injured – that it was impossible for him to play. Not to come in at the end in the final 11 seconds and at least distract somebody, to me, was crazy. Now, maybe Popovich just has complete control of that team, and he told Kawhi, no, no, you're not going out there at all. But he played him a lot during the fourth quarter, so I don't know whose decision that was. But at a minimum, even if he's injured, somebody has to give a full man to him, right? You can't double like they did down the stretch. You can't, like... So, I mean, you're not trying to run a pick and roll, whatever you're trying to do with Pau Gasol there that didn't happen. I mean, it was just an ugly, ugly possession. I think you have to have him out there on the court. If this were LeBron James, he would be getting crushed today. Any doubt about that? No, not at all. I mean, he's always going to take a higher level of critique than anybody else in the NBA because he's LeBron James, because he's on the Mount Rushmore, at least certainly of the current generation of NBA players and kind of the guy. So he's always going to take more criticism than anybody else is. Kawhi gives you 22 and 15, but I do think it's strange that he wasn't out there for the last 11 seconds. Maybe he's he was more dinged up than we thought. But if that's true, then how can he come back in game six? That's a good point. I mean, but, the, you know, a lot of players are going to say, oh, I can go. And then you find out the doctors will tell you, no, you actually can't go. Like right, he and wants I understand. to play. Maybe that ends up being the case. If he plays in game six, it definitely makes me think, wait, why can you play in game six? and you were totally unable to go in the final 11 seconds of this game. Fair or foul to ask that question, Danny G and Justin? Yeah, while I was watching the fourth quarter, I had the same thought as you, Clay, but when you saw him sitting on the bench, did you see him with the blue strip stretching his ankle out? And then when he was on the court, it looked like he was trying to work it out. So maybe that's why he was there, because he thought he could go, and he just couldn't do it. But the, one of the thoughts on my mind was, well, are they saving him? Uh, you know, Are they being extra cautious so that he can go for game six? But you're right. I mean, if he comes back and plays in game six on Thursday night in Houston, to me that's a sign that the injury wasn't that severe, right? And again, I'm not saying you need to run an entire offensive set for him. But when he's been in the game for many different possessions in the fourth quarter and you have 11 seconds left, you can at least put him over in a corner and make somebody have to respect what he's going to do. I mean, you can't tell me that he's not more valuable than the five guys they had on the court at that time and or that he's not capable of elevating and at least putting up a shot. I mean, again, if the ball gets kicked to him, I was just I was just very surprised to see him sit out and then I'm surprised to say he's going to see he says he's going to play in game six. Now, maybe that's just... You know, him in the bravado of, oh, yeah, I'm going to go, and and the Spurs are going to sit back and say, oh, no, you're not. And he's going to sit out game six and then come back healthy, presumably, for a game seven. I don't know. I just thought it was very strange that he wasn't in the game if he's capable of playing on Thursday. Again, maybe that's being too, uh, too critical, but when you saw how bad that possession was with 11 seconds to go for the Spurs, for a Greg Popovich coach team to not even get a shot off with 11 seconds to play there, I mean, I think that's a sign of how much this team revolves around Kawhi Leonard in moments when they need buckets. Be sure to catch live editions of Outkick the Coverage with Clay Travis weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern, 3 a.m. Pacific on Fox Sports Radio and the iHeartRadio app. I'm not sure how often it's going to be on the show, but the Animal Thunderdome has swept the nation, all 50 states demanding more, more, more. That's what they're saying here about Outkick the Coverage is Animal Thunderdome coverage. The most trusted man in animal and human news and now we have a new opening for this segment and it sounds a little bit something like this ladies and gentlemen i'm just glad i was there boys and girls i thought he thought i was like this ginormous piece of chicken dying times here this is animal thunderdome 
That is extraordinary. We got two bits of Animal Thunderdome news. Honestly, I feel like Jim McElwain and the, the shark could count. This news comes to us, let's see, from Jonathan Cooper. Coco Cooper says, Police say a 16-year-old high school student jumped into the zebra exhibit at the zoo on a dare. Why did he do it? A girl told him she'd give him her number if he did it. Again, haters going to hate. Haters going to hate indeed. We had the guy who got attacked by the crocodile trying to impress a girl. Now a 16-year-old high school student has jumped into the zebra exhibit at the zoo on a dare. Girl told him she would give him her number. Hopefully he got that number. This story also remarkable. Bears on the rampage in Connecticut. Huge picture of a bear. Listen to this story. Uh, A neighbor came across the street in a panic. She's a little old lady screaming that a bear got on the back porch and is slamming on her glass door. They called 911 and they said that. They said that a bear spent considerable time on a deck and was reluctant to leave. He's trying to get into a house. He's unafraid. He's not listening to the noise, the screaming, or the yelling. Why was the bear trying to get into the house? Because the lady was baking brownies. Uh, It looked cute on the railing. The bear was angry about not being able to get to the brownies. At one point, we had an alligator who climbed up to the second floor, a member of a balcony in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. Listen to this. At one point, the bear was able to open the screen door. It appeared that he was going to be able to get into the home, but he couldn't manage to open the glass slider. Finally, the bear, he actually left the kitchen area, went to a second set of doors, and then he tried a third set of doors. The bear tried to break in through three different floors, and all because a woman was baking brownies, and the bear could smell them. This, my friends, the Animal Thunderdome, it's very real. And the Bears are out to get us. I am Clay Travis, the most trusted name in animal-human relations anywhere. That's an incredible open. Incredible open by our guy Vito there now for the Animal Thunderdome. Anytime you guys see a story, my theory is the animals are out to get us. They're waging war against us at any moment. You could find yourself in mortal peril as a result of animals. Whenever you see those stories, send them to me. At Clay Travis on Twitter, the bear who tried to get in three doors while brownies were being baked, everyone in Connecticut lucky to be alive. I don't think there's any doubt. And again, Jim McElwain with the shark. This story has gone viral. If there's not tons of kids showing up in SEC football stadiums with naked Jim McElwain photos as he tries to uh, to, to claim it's not him, Do we have that audio again of Jim McElwain? Like, if this were you, if there was somebody who looked like you on a viral internet meme, and it was not you, like, this inevitably will end up happening to me at some point. It's happened a couple of times. There have been guys who look like me on viral internet memes. You just make fun of it. You don't come out and try to, like, treat it as a completely serious story because that makes me think that it is Jim McElwain. Again, if I said to you, Is that you who's in that viral internet meme naked on the back of a shark? Would you respond like Jim McElwain did here? First and foremost, I don't know who it is, but it isn't me. Clearly. (laughs) I mean, what's your just feeling in general? Just that something like this could even get out there and become a story? Well, I guess that's for you guys to answer. And, you know, in the world we live, what is a story? I just know this. It isn't me. Listen to the guy furiously typing in the background during that interview. The guy's like, why did I become a sports writer? Jim McElwain answering a question about whether or not it's him on naked on the back of a shark virally. It's gone everywhere on the Internet. The guy in the background just hitting his keyboard like, like, like we just found out that Donald Trump's firing his FBI director. It's like, I got to get every word of this right. This is my Pulitzer moment. This is my opportunity. Listen to that. What, what's your just feeling in general? Just that something like this I, could even get out there and become a story. Well, I guess that's... <laughs> Just furiously typing away. Oh, my God. I got to be on top of this. And the follow-up. Got to follow up. I'm going to be honest with you. A little disappointed in the Florida Gator uh, media core there. Because when Jim McElwain denies that it's him... Why did nobody follow up and say, gotcha, coach. I understand that you would deny that it's you. 
But isn't that exactly what you would expect somebody to say if they were asked if they were posing naked on the back of a shark? Just saying, not sure that I buy McIlwain's denial 100% there because that's exactly what you would expect him to do. Coach, uh, there's this picture of you that looks exactly like you on the back of a shark. And by the way, you know, I went shark, uh, and, and I went shark fishing once, so I've been there. I know what it's like to get a shark into your boat. I haven't told this story before. When I was in college, that's exactly what you'd expect Jim McElwain to say, though. Right? He's going to deny that it's him. Unless he was awesome, and he was like, you know what? I went deep sea fishing. Jimbo, who I was with, not Jimbo Fisher, but somebody named Jimbo, because if you go deep sea fishing in the south in Florida, you have to have a guy named Jimbo in the boat with you. That's a rule. Jimbo and I were out. We're drinking a bunch of beers, and Jimbo said, hey, coach, we're going to catch a shark out here. And I said, you're full of it. If we catch a shark, I'm going to take strip down naked. You can take my picture on, riding on the back of that shark. Then what happens? Catch a shark. Next thing you know, what do you got to do? Strip down naked, get your picture taken on him. That's how you pay off a bet. Otherwise, you can't trust a guy. Guy says, I'll strip down naked and climb on the back of a shark. If we catch one, that's what you have to do. Got to do it if it happens. I went when I was, uh, so when I graduated law school, I moved to the United States Virgin Islands. I lived in St. Thomas. A lot of you probably have been through St. Thomas on a cruise ship. Uh, a lot of cruise ships stop there every single week. So I practiced law down there for a couple of years. And I went out on a uh, went out on a deep sea fishing boat. It's the only time I've ever done it. And the Virgin Islands is an interesting place because if you've ever spent any time in the Caribbean, a lot of Caribbean islands, it doesn't take very long once you get off the island for the water to drop precipitously and for you to reach deep sea level. You know, where in other words, there's lots of different uh, different animals and everything else because you drop kind of off the continental shelf. I believe is what it is. Anyway. I'm not a geologist, but I know you didn't have to go very far off of St. Thomas in order for the water to get very deep and for there to be a lot of opportunity there at deep sea fishing. Like sometimes you have to go way out from a land. You don't have to go that far out from the, from St. Thomas. So we're out there in a boat. It's awful, but I don't, I would never go deep sea fishing again because the seas are so rough and we weren't in that big of a boat. And I was like, I feel like I'm going to throw up. This is not that enjoyable. So we have those like big, like they're like cock holsters. You ever see those things that you fish out of? They're like you put on a belt on, and it's got like a it's got like a hole. <laughs> it's got a hole where you put the fishing rod in, and you can like kind of walk around with it. At least this is how I remember it. I think this is true. You got like a big belt, like a WWF championship belt, and you can put your rod in there, and then you can reel it in. So we're fishing, and we catch a barracuda, and we're rolling in the barracuda, and as we're rolling in the barracuda. It gets up to like top of the water level, and you can see the barracuda kind of like skimming across the top of the water. And we've caught him with the hook, and we're rolling him in. And the barracuda's big, but it's not that big of a fish, right? If you ever seen a barracuda out, I've been you know fishing, I've been I've been out snorkeling, like seen a big barracuda. Like it's a big fish, but it's not an overwhelmingly huge fish. So you're out there reeling in the barracuda, and I kid you not, it's like something out of National Geographic. All of a sudden, you see a fin come up behind the barracuda and next thing you know this shark has just eaten the barracuda and in the process of eating the barracuda the shark eats the barracuda and the hook and then we got the shark hooked so now we got this massive shark I mean it's like a six foot shark right that we have hooked and we got to reel him in it's just me and another dude and then the, the fisherman guy out there who's had like 40 beers like I'm like this doesn't seem very safe and so we got this reel and we're reeling in the shark and I swear to God, we pull the shark up next to the boat. And if you've ever been out fishing, you know that like a lot of times when you get a big fish in fresh water, somebody will lean over with like a uh, with like a net, and then they'll bring in the fish because at some point you get the fish, you know, get the shark close enough to the boat, and the shark's just thrashing, not a happy shark, just slamming into the side of the boat. We're not even in that big of a boat, guys. I mean, like there's probably I don't know like two feet between us and the water. I mean, it's pretty easy. I'm thinking, like, this shark's going to freaking capsize us, and then he's going to eat us out here in the water because we're just going to be floating around. I hope he eats the other guys instead of me. But then if he eats the other guys, there's going to be blood in the water. I'm going to be done for. I don't know how you get out of here. I don't know how you get out alive. I'm like, I would probably have just cut the shark loose and let him go. We got Captain Ahab out here with us, and Captain Ahab is like, we're going to get the shark in the boat, and then you're going to eat it. I don't don't want the shark in the boat. There's hardly room for the three of us in the boat. The last thing I want is a six-foot shark thrashing around. So anyway... I swear to God, the guy's got a net, like a real-life net like you would use to get a big catfish in the boat or something. Leans over. This shark is snapping left and right. He's slamming into the boat, 
Captain Ahab just leans over. Miraculously, he's still got both of his arms and both of his legs. And he's like, can you help me with the net? I'm like, the hell I can. I'm not trying to catch a shark in a net and then pull him in, like a fishing net, like the same thing I would use to get a, a catfish in. So Captain Ahab leans over, somehow gets the shark in the net. And by the way, no idea how this happens. And then the shark weighs like 100 pounds. You know, it's like a big, big fish. And so he's like, can you help me get in here? So I'm leaned over, never touched a shark in my life. Snark, shark snapping left and right. We get him in the boat, yank the shark up, and immediately I run away from the shark. Shark is in the boat, and it's just like spinning around trying to bite people in the boat. I'm like, well, what do you do now? He's like, well, you got to wait it out. I'm like, we're going to wait out a shark? He's like, the shark has to have, has to, you know, breathe underwater. I'm like, yeah, I know that. But we're on a tiny boat, and this shark, I'm not kidding you, is just swimming around literally on our boat trying to snap people. Eventually he died. I didn't get my picture taken with him. Did not get my picture laying on top of the shark naked, just for full disclosure. But we did cut him up and eat him. So I know what it's like to catch a shark on a deep-sea fishing trip, and I understand the desire that Jim McElwain may have had to drop his pants and be naked with the shark, be one with nature. But I think if I were Jim McElwain here, I'd just own it. You know what? I killed that shark. And then I decided I wanted to hump that shark. And that's perfectly normal behavior for an SEC football coach who has to go up against Nick Saban every year. Nick Saban will drive you crazy. You want evidence of how much Nick Saban will drive somebody crazy? Here's Jim McElwain's fat ass on top of a shark. That's what happens when you play against Nick Saban every year. Eventually, you go insane. Be sure to catch live editions of Outkick, the coverage with Clay Travis weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern, 3 a.m. Pacific. We bring in Jeff Schwartz as we do every single Wednesday, I had to think about what day it was, every single Wednesday on this program in hour two. Jeff, what's up, my man? Do you believe Jim McElwain when he says it's not him naked on top of a shark? <laughs> uh, I saw the original. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have to think if you're the head coach of Florida, you're not going to be remotely in a situation where you get pictured naked humping a shark. Would you believe it was me if a guy looked somewhat like me and was naked humping a shark. Would you believe any denial that I gave, or would you totally assume it's me? I think you've moved past something like doing something like that. I feel like you wouldn't do that anymore. Like, like you, you've made it now to where that's something you don't have to do. <laughs> I can definitely see making it. But have you ever been de- deep sea fishing? Uh, no, I am not a fan of the ocean. Yeah, I, I mean, so I get it. Like I, I was saying earlier, I've only been once, and we got out to sea. And the thing about it that I should have realized is that deep sea fishing is like that means you go out a long way. Like I didn't think I, I know, but people are like, "Oh, you're an idiot. You're deep sea fishing. Like you have to go." I didn't think you'd have to go that far past land. Like we were way out in the either. ocean. Yeah, the last the last time I went was for a buddy's bachelor party, and there were twenty of us on the boat, and nineteen people caught their allotment of fish. They caught twenty fish each. One person caught zero fish because he threw up the whole time, and that was myself. So I threw up for three hours, three hours straight because you just got seasick. Yeah, I just was miserable. Yeah, yeah. And you think about it is you can't come back. Like I, that, that's my thing about I don't like boats. Like I'm a land person. People say like I could have never been in the navy. I could have never been in like an old school like fisherman out trying to catch whales. No way, because I don't like being on boats. The boats are rocky. Uh, they are uh, like people are like, oh, I can't wait to go on this cruise. And all I'm thinking is that's just a big prison. You know, like you're <laughs> just on a big floating prison. There may be fun things to do, but if you need to leave the boat, there's nothing you can do to leave the boat. And that's not for me. Like if I'm on land, I'm totally fine. I lived on an island and I li- I was fine going on boats like to go to like short trips. Like, OK, I'm going to go on this little, you know, like right. it was big. Like you get on ferries, you go to like different islands. Like, okay, I'm fine with that, but don't put me out. I can, you know, I'm not going for a long distance where I can't see land. Like, I'm just not going to do it. It's not very enjoyable to me. The only thing, the only part of dying, the only thing I guess I'm afraid of dying from is drowning. Like, that like that would be the worst. I grew up on the beach. I mean, I grew up in Santa Monica. The beach was right there. We went all the time. I just, yeah, I'm sort of the same as you, where, like, where I just, don't I don't go in the water if I don't have to. I don't go on boats if I don't have to. We're never going on a cruise again. My wife and I went one time and she got so sick that she became delirious. So we're not we're not doing boats. We're staying on land. She was delirious. What was she doing when she was sick? Oh man. She said she she claimed that she was plotting to leave me in Mexico. 
Are you sure she was sick? Uh, I mean, we she had was, only been dating a year at that point, so it's completely possible. But that she was, was just going to abandon was, you in Mexico? She didn't think you'd yeah, be able to was, get back in? No, she was going to. No, she was going to leave in Mexico. She was going to stay in Mexico. Oh, she, she was going to stay in Mexico. Yeah, she was going to get a house and just live in Mexico. And, she was so delirious. She took too much. She took. She took too much Dramamine. Like, she, and then she went down to the infirmary about five days in the cruise, and they're like, "Listen, lady." Just just sit here for a couple minutes. We'll give you some medicine, make you feel better. Um, and yeah, it was uh, it was. I had to go down to eat dinner. You know, when on a cruise you have like a formal dining room and you have like your time to eat. Yeah. And so I went down and ate by myself, <laughs> just like I had both meals, her meal nice. and my meal. We're talking to Jeff Schwartz. You can follow him on Twitter at Jeff Schwartz. Uh, so you don't believe it's Jim McElwain. Did you hear his response where he made it sound like he was really serious about it? Like, you know, like he was getting quizzed about, you know, the FBI director getting fired or something. Here's that audio. If you haven't heard it, here's Jim McElwain explaining that it's not him. And listen to the guy furiously typing in the background who definitely wants to give up on life. You've become part of this big viral photo. Sure. I mean, what's your feeling on this situation? Well, first and foremost, I don't know who it is, but it isn't me. Clearly, <laughs> I mean, it's what what's your just feeling in general? Just that something like this I, could even get out there and become a story. Well, I guess that's for you guys to answer. And you know, in the world we live, what is a story? I just know this: it isn't me. Isn't he taking it way too seriously? Like, if he had just said, "You know what, yeah. I got a better ass than that guy," trust me. You know, like I mean, all and I would have actually been more likely to believe him then. But when you treat a ridiculous story like with total seriousness, it makes me think that it's actually you. And over half of the people who voted, almost seven thousand people, believe it's actually Jim McElwain humping the shark. I think he could have used this as a recruiting tool. He could have done something with it. I feel like Harbaugh would have done something fun with this if someone thought it was him. Oh, Harbaugh like would have walked in. Harbaugh would have walked in, turned around to the media, dropped his pants, and said, "Look at this ass. You think this ass is that ass?" <laughs> like, yeah, would've... I think I agree. He should have made it. Fun. He should have done something with recruiting with the shark. I know there's no, there's no. By the way, what is is, is is there a kid dying in the background there? Is there a kangaroo what... loose in your home? Are we are we in danger? <laughs> they're they're just sitting in their high chairs watching Mickey, and they're playing with each other, just screaming. I just closed the door. No, we're good now. It's crazy. It's just. It's, <laughs> It's just ma- every morning. It's just madness. You know that's how it is. It's such a dad. Madness. It's such a dad. I got three. It's such a dad move. Like I'll just shut the door and they'll be fine. It's like Lord of the Flies in there right now. You got uh, Mickey Mouse Playhouse on. Door shut. Your wife's going to go back and listen to the audio, and she's going to be like, "You shut the door on the kids." You know they could have. They could have died in the thirty she's seconds. Right, she's right there. She's like just smiling at me, and she's like, "Just." I, she's like, "I don't know what's going on." I just close the door. Oh, I got you. So we got. Uh, have we talked? Did we talk to you about the draft? Right, or did we not talk to you about the draft? I can't even remember. It's been two weeks now. I think we have. All right, we talked about the draft. Yeah, so, no football. This is like a dead time. There's, there's literally no football news. It's, it's crazy. You're an NBA fan too. Uh, like last night, we got a good game between the Spurs and the Rockets. But so far, the up to that point, I think it was like 15 out of 16 games have been double digits. So we finally got a play. Were you watching last night when Manu Ginobili blocked that shot? Yes, and I watched the replay this morning. Uh, you know, the NBA. Like I, I hear everyone complaining about it, but I, I feel like we're just waiting to get to the the best series. Like it's okay to have these poor series essentially, because then you get to Cavs Warriors, which should be really epic. So I'm okay with, I guess there being uh, not much to talk about. Would you, would you prefer boring. instead of the NBA series going on for as long as they have? And obviously the Cavs and the Warriors have both, both gone eight. No, in the first two rounds of the playoffs to see the Cavs and the Warriors play like a best of 15 and knock out a couple of rounds. So you could see the first team to eight, let's say, instead of the first team to four. I've heard you talk about that. I feel like that's too much. I mean, seven games is a little urgency. If you play 15 games, it's not as much urgency. I feel early on, you know, teams will be like, ah, you know, if we lose this game, we'll make it up tomorrow uh, and whatnot. I think if you you need to shorten the first round to five games. I don't know. I still don't know why they went to seven. Uh, you know, they had a couple upsets. So what hockey has upsets, and, and, you know, people seem to like the Predators being in the Western Conference Finals. So you shorten the first round, and, you know, and then you just hope that you get some competitive series and, and you end up having, like, a game like last night that's a good game for the NBA. But I think there's just a, um, you know, LeBron has is, is just been so good for so long that he's eliminated teams who thought they were going to be the next thing, right? The Hawks, the the Raptors, they thought they were going to be the next 
great Eastern Conference power, and he's just rolled through them. I think we look back on LeBron in 20 years and just the, the wreckage he left behind him. He's just so marvelous. Fox Sports Radio has the best sports talk lineup in the nation. Catch all of our shows at foxsportsradio.com and within the iHeartRadio app. We were talking with Jeff Schwartz at Jeff Schwartz on Twitter. Jeff, did you see the picture of the Alabama fan? He reached out to me on Twitter who has the huge tattoo of Nick Saban on his back. I saw the picture. I did not know that he reached out to you. That is, I don't know what possesses a person to do that. What would you have to be paid to get a tattoo of Chip Kelly on your back? You played for Chip <laughs> Kelly at Oregon. Like if I said right now, first of all, you have a hairy back too, so it'd be, uh, yes. it'd be unfortunate. But like let's say that, you, that I said to you, all right, I want to pay you. You're also Jewish, which means I think you go to hell if you get a tattoo, so the price has to be even higher. Um, Correct. What would, what would I have to pay you to get a tattoo of Chip Kelly on your back? It's it's not that we go to hell. I just I'm not allowed to be buried in a Jewish cemetery, which I guess is sort of the same thing. But um, which seems, by the way, kind of draconian, right? Like I don't know what the when the rules are being made, but like a tattoo, like seems like that's a pretty aggressive thing to say. Like you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery. Like did people get that many tattoos back in the day of uh, of of the early Judaism? Like was that a big thing? Like I I, I, I can't imagine I not, that I'm back in the Sea of Galilee early. days. Jewish people are just lining up getting, like, tribal tattoos of, uh, of barbed wire on their arms. I have not studied the uh, history of the, uh, of the Jews and tattoos. It's my, it's my upbringing. <laughs> but isn't it like, as soon as I heard that story, the first time I heard it was actually on Curb Your Enthusiasm when Larry David was talking about it. Because, I mean, it's not something that I would even think. Like, I don't think about somebody in biblical times having a tattoo, or it seems to me like it would be a really bad decision to say, you know what, people are dying all the time from infections and everything else, but what I'm going to do is allow you to take this hot needle and just put something on my arm, and I'll either die and have to get my arm amputated, or I'll have like a barbed wire <laughs> tattoo, and I'll be the coolest guy and like get Samamine. I think it's more about just not mutilating your body in general. You know, you're not allowed to even pleasure yourself and there's a lot of things in the in the in the bible so, so you're done that, for then <laughs> you've been done yeah, for for a um, long time you and everybody else listening out 12. there is done for yeah um uh, yeah no I, I actually wrote something about that in in he was a hebrew school maybe when i was i went to this hebrew high school for two years after my bar mitzvah and i think i wrote something about about that exact thing as is, is, i forget what the example was but i wrote a paper on that subject in hebrew or so no, no, in English. Oh, so what do you go to Hebrew school and write in English for? Um, yeah, so your, your Hebrew school, like I learned, you know, obviously you learn the prayers and you learn how to read and write Hebrew, but I was never very good at it. Like for my bar mitzvah, I just straight memorized the Torah. Like I didn't, I didn't know, like I, I didn't know what I was reading essentially. I just memorized my little portion and then I just knocked it out. And then as soon as I went to the Hebrew high school, it was more learning about Judaism than it was learning about Hebrew. That Were there sense. good-looking girls in Hebrew high school? No. That kind of sucks, because I would think we're, the only we're reason... Not, to... We're not... We're generally not, like, that good-looking of a of a, of a a religion. I don't know. I, I mean, I think in Israel we are, but in America... We have the ugly... Some good-looking Jews. <laughs> so your, I, your I assessment of, of Jews in general in America is that they're an ugly people? No, I don't think they're, they're – no, they're not terribly – like, the women are just are not the greatest-looking women all the time. There's nothing wrong with that. No, I mean, you got to move to the South. I You're in the, the South, South now. Yeah. And you picked up yeah, a Southern I, girl. I picked a Southern girl, not Jewish. So wh- how did I get onto the topic about tattoos? What, 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 was, my, what was my lead in there? I've totally forgot. Oh, oh if, I would, if I would get – how much would you pay me to get oh, a yeah, Chip yeah. Kelly tattoo in my back? To get a Chip Kelly um, tattoo, how much would I have to pay you to get it? Like the guy for, gets a Nick Saban tattoo. And by the way, not a good Nick Saban tattoo. He looks like zombie Nick Saban. He does not look like a Nick Saban who's been living well. And how much would I have to pay you to get a Chip Kelly tattoo? Let, let me uh, – probably, probably pay off my house. How much if, money do I need to get a tattoo on my back? So maybe the upper, it has to be like, it has to be close to seven figures, I think. Seven <laughs> figures? Yeah, I'm not getting it. Why would I get a tattoo? I'm not getting a tattoo for Chip Kelly. Give me seven figures, I'll do it. Seven figures. So if we put, put up a GoFundMe and somebody would raise seven figures, I mean, that, that's kind of a, a normal response, right? Like, I think the idea of getting another man's face tattooed on your back is something that just about every single man who's listening to us right now would say, no way on earth I'm going to do it, except Alabama fans. 
Like there are lots of Alabama fans. And by the way, again, not a good Nick Saban tattoo. You can go see, seek this out if you want to type in my name and Nick Saban tattoo. One of my listeners slash readers was at Talladega, the NASCAR event, set behind a guy who had the big Nick Saban tattoo. And then, because social media connects everyone everywhere, the guy with the Nick Saban tattoo reached out to me on Twitter and said, I'm the guy with the Nick Saban tattoo. So I retweeted him. So uh, congratulations to that missing, guy. Isn't he missing a couple years on there? Yeah, on, he's, on the he's at least one title behind on Alabama. Like I, I'm assuming that he didn't have the money to continue to update the uh, the tattoo on his back. Not a well-done tattoo. If you were going to get a tattoo of Nick Saban, then that would be an awful decision. You know, it reminds me, one of the dumbest tattoos I've ever seen, and there are a lot of dumb tattoos out there. Did you see Vince Young got his name tattooed on his back like it was his name on his jersey? Have you seen that picture? Uh, Vince Young, I like. I would be like. I don't know what they do in order to make decisions on who to draft. But if Vince Young had come in and I'd been like, "You have any tattoos?" and he's like, "Yeah, I got V. Period Young tattooed on my back, (laughs) just like it's on my jersey." I'd be like, "This guy is off our draft board." There's no way I'm entrusting the, the the franchise's future to a guy who thought, you know, what it would be awesome to do get a V. This is real life. This actually happened. Vince Young got a V. Period Young tattooed on his upper back just like it was his name on his jersey which is such an incredibly dumb thing to even think of that i would just take him right off the board no way i'm giving the future of my franchise to that guy this tattoo was pretty uh was pretty big when i was in high school is getting your initials on your triceps i've never understood that one either initials on the triceps. i've got incredible tricep muscles so just like all three initials or just like your first name and your last no, name? No, no. Like, you know, people would put like, I put a GS, like a my, you know, G on my left arm and an S on oh. my right tricep. Like I never, I never kind of understood that idea. See, and the thing know, about. I just am so anti-tattoo. Yeah. The, the thing about that decision to me is I blame women because the only reason men do anything is because they think it's more likely to get women. There are women out there sleeping with guys and they're like sleeping with guys who have decided to get their initials on their tricep muscles and I blame women because that's why men do it. They wouldn't do it if it wasn't effective. Correct. Yes. And I think that if I got a tattoo, my wife would sleep with me even less. <laughs> Uh, I think that's 100% true. There's no doubt at all. Okay, so as we come down the stretch here of the NBA offseason, Jay Cutler has decided to go into the booth. Uh, you, I don't think you know Jay Cutler, but you called a game. You went out and did the spring game for Oregon. It's incredibly difficult if you aren't a quarterback to get a gig calling games. How do you think Cutler will be, and is it fair that these quarterbacks get to skip every other person whether it's Romo whether it's Cutler like quarterbacks have an automatic path to the booth if they want it whereas offensive linemen like you get no respect I I'm okay let's start with the last one so like I'm not I obviously want to do this like I, I don't get upset that Cutler and Romo have these jobs I just get I just want a chance to audition for the job if that makes sense like I get that they're going to get you know they're quarterbacks I mean Romo's quarterback for America's team of course he's going to get in line for that type of gig. Uh, as far as who will be good, you know, they put Cutler with Charles Davis. I mean, he's going to be, it's not going to, he's going to have an easier time than Romo will be. Infinitely Charles easier. Davis, yes. Charles Davis will just throw him softballs. I mean, Cutler probably doesn't even have to talk about a lot of things. They might just ask him, hey, I want you to just focus on what the quarterback is doing here. Every time that we need to go to the quarterback, we'll throw it to you. And Charles will just talk about everything else. I mean, it could be as simple as that situation. Because Charles Davis is great. So they put him in a great situation. Romo, on the other hand, you know, he's the number one guy. He he's not going to have a crutch like Charles Davis in the booth. So, you know, maybe they, they threw this to Cutler as, hey, well, you, just, you know, this is kind of an audition year. We'll see how you do. Uh, but you know, it takes time. Troy Aikman wasn't that great early on, and some other guys weren't great. And now look, now look where Troy's at now. It just takes a lot of reps, and that's what I've learned doing the Oregon spring game. Is you know, it just you 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 need the reps, and you know, for those guys that are starting out at the top level. And there's going to be more scrutiny, and hopefully Fox and CBS give them the time uh, to work through the early game issues they have. Yeah, that's a good point, because I do think that booth with Charles Davis, who's phenomenally good, Kevin Burkhardt, who's also phenomenally good, and Jay Cutler, they're in a three-man there, as opposed to CBS, which is just throwing Tony Romo completely into the mix with Jim Nance. Uh, And I will say this, I do think that quarterbacks are very comfortable with being criticized, because their entire career has been being criticized, so they're not going to suddenly lose their mind over people on Twitter saying mean things to them. But it is a different level of skill set, and I'm fascinated to see how those guys do. 
And, I mean, you go through boot camp. Like, you tried to audition, and you're still working on trying to get to call games at some point. What's the most challenging aspect to you? Like, you've played football your entire life. You obviously know what you're seeing on the field. What's the most challenging thing about being in the booth and trying to call a game? So when I went back and listened to the Oregon game, um, I was okay with the information that I gave as far as the plays and what I saw. It's just finding different ways to say things. Like, you can't just say good all the time. Right. You have to find different – and that's what I ran into is, like, how do you say – a wide receiver ran a good route, but don't say good. Do you say he ran an efficient route? Do you say he ran a textbook route? Like you have to find different adjectives to explain things that happen and, you know, and increase your, your, you know, your diction. And that's what I found like rewatching the game, uh, the Oregon spring game is I was fine as far as what I said about the play. Like I knew what the play was. I knew what the coverage was. I knew all those, it's, but it's a matter of, of coming up with different ways to explain what I saw. And that's, I think what takes time, and, you know, for Romo, at least, he gets two games a week. I mean, he'll have a lot of practice. But like I said, it's just at the top level, and he'll, he'll be really scrutinized. But he might – you know, both those guys, I think, will get a year pass from the, from the media critics. You know, they understand they're coming right from the, the field onto the booth, and they'll probably get a pass. You know, Cutler maybe not so much because he's not as well liked as Romo. But I think Romo will get – no matter how he does first year, he could be excellent, he could be bad. I think they'll, everyone will say, well, let's give him a year to, do, you know, to figure it out. Speaking of uh, getting a pass, did you see the Alabama fan who exposed himself in the convenience store? Yes, I, I just I it, your eighty five percent thing just it just plays out all the time on Twitter. I believe that eighty five percent of Alabama fans are total idiots. In case you're wondering, the eighty five percent who could not get admitted to the University of Alabama, and time after time we see people in Alabama gear doing ridiculous things. I've got to send you a video that I haven't been willing to post yet of a woman dancing at Talladega. Not a good-looking woman. She's naked. And there is an Alabama fan in full Alabama gear, like getting as close to her as he possibly can, recording the dance on his, uh, on his iPhone. I mean, it is, uh, it is unbelievable what goes down at Talladega. Uh, yeah, the, that story, just he exposed himself. I, I don't know, man. I just don't, I just don't get it. I don't know. I, I've never felt the need to, to pull out my junk in front of anyone, really. <laughs> I don't find the need to take pictures of my junk and send them to anybody either. Um, I've just never understood that need. Women don't like the look of, of your junk. They don't. So I don't know. They I don't get why you are so well with sending it. They particularly don't like when you expose yourself to them and they're not at all involved in an amorous relationship with you. Like the guy in full Alabama gear who, if you haven't seen the story, just walked into a convenience store and pulled down his pants and exposed himself, and then they now, tracked now him down. He, now, was he like, was he, was he ready to go, or was he just, just as, as, as it even worse? Like, I don't know. Flaccid? I don't know if he, was a, if he was a if he was a noodle or a wrench. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure which of those he was, but uh, I do know that he has since been arrested. Roll Tide, baby. Jeff Schwartz, appreciate you joining us. Take care. You know, when you're an Alabama Crimson Tide fan, things are going rough. Lose to Clemson. Next thing you know, your fan base is out there exposing themselves to everybody in the convenience store. And actually, when you expose yourself to them, people like Alabama fans are like, you know, at least we didn't kill any trees or teabag somebody in the French Quarter this time. At least this is a minor crime, relatively speaking, for an Alabama Crimson Tide fan to be enjoy- involved in. Be sure to catch live editions of Outkick, the coverage with Clay Travis weekdays at 6 a.m. Eastern, 3 a.m. Pacific on Fox Sports Radio and the iHeartRadio app. And speaking of the best lineup anywhere, it's Tim Tebow, and it's time for Tim Tebow Watch. The son of God attempting to climb the minor league baseball ranks. He's right now in single A with the Columbia Fireflies. And what did he do last night? We go to Jason Martin at Jmart Outkick for Tebow Watch. Folks, just one more game since our last Tebow watch. Actually, back on Monday against the Lakewood Blue Claws. And Columbia actually won one against these guys, a 5-1 final. They lost the first three of four, but they won that one. Now 15 of 16 on the season. That's good for a third-place tie with Asheville in the South Atlantic League's Southern Division. Tim Tebow hitting in sixth and playing left field. One for four with a single, also a strikeout. Didn't change Tebow's average, which is still at 242. He still has no RBIs since April the 16th. 
Right now, this very second, the Gator Messiah is in Salisbury, Maryland for three games against the Delmarva Shorebirds, then four more on the road in New Jersey against the same Lakewood Blue Claws the Fireflies just finished playing four against. Columbia playing seven games in seven days, all on the road. They won't be back in South Carolina until May the 18th. Tebow batting 152 on the road compared to 290 at home. Also, 303 in day games, just 210 at night. All three games with Delmarva, evening matchup. So we'll see if Timothy can end the away plague and deliver bread and fishes to Fireflies <laughs> fans up north. And that has been Tebow Watch for this Wednesday, May 10th, 2017. And Timothy saw it, and he saw that it was good. Let's glow, Fireflies. I'm so excited. Nathan Martin just really taking over the Tebow watch. Lots of weak starts early. Big time performance of late.